Hello everyone, welcome to chapter 3. In this chapter we're going to talk about the periodic table, how we use it, it's the ultimate cheat sheet, and um, also how the trends occur. And so in part 1 we're going to look at just the basic components and how the periodic table is organized. So in 1869, Dmitry Mendeleev noticed that there were certain groups of elements that were similar. And so he tried to put together something for his students where they could look and see, okay, these all had these characteristics in common. And when he started doing it, he noticed that there was a periodic or repeating pattern to it. And so he summarized his observations in this periodic law. And the periodic law says that when elements are arranged in order of increasing mass or number, certain sets of properties occur periodically. All right, and so that's the actual law. So how we use that is we look and see how things are related as they go across or cross a period, which is what we call the rows, or down a group, is what we call the columns. And elements in a group or, or period have very similar pro properties, okay? So, I mean, sorry, in groups or families have very similar properties. Now notice that Mendeleev saw patterns, and that's how I tell y'all to remember things in chemistry is by the patterns rather than trying to memorize everything. The law tells us these patterns, but it does not tell us why it happens. That's what we use the quantum theory for and how the, elect how the electrons go in the certain orbitals and how they move around and things like that. But it is a very handy thing because when we're trying to figure out how things behave, if we know they're in the same group as something else, we know they're going to be similar characteristics. Okay, so the elements in the periodic table, we're going to classify those as metals, nonmetals, or metalloids, which sort of have the same um, characteristics of both. The periodic table, we also divide into something we call main group elements, and those are the ones that are very predictable, okay? They are the ones that we can say, ah, that's going to do this. Then we have transition metals, elements, sorry, okay, transition elements. And these transition and inner transition metals have properties that aren't as predictable just because of where they are and just because of how their electrons are ordered. And so when you see them on a periodic table, they're going to have like a designation of B, where your normal ones are going to have A's. Now, lots of different people do periodic tables, and so you're going to see a lot of iterations of it, but we typically go by this 1A, 2A thing, okay? So some, some just number them 1, 2 through 18, and that's okay too, but uh, we are using the, the A and the B's. So main group elements have this A outside their number. So we have 1A, 2A. Notice we go over to the yellow, which is 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 8A. So all of the A's are what we call main group elements. So if it's something from the first two columns over here, or these columns on the other end, they're going to follow all of our nice little rules, say, and we can easily predict things in Gen Chem as to what's going to happen to them. The transition elements are going to be these in the B rows, okay, in the B rows. And then we have some even down farther here which we call the inner transition elements. And the reason we call them inner transition is notice that we have 57, and then we come down here to 58, and we have 89, comes down to 90. These go through 58 through 71, and then come back and start back up at the 72. So they are in between 57 and 72, 
for the top row and in between 89 and 104 in the bottom row and the reason is because it they first of all they don't follow rules well at all and so typically it for general chemistry students we don't even talk about them they're highly radioactive okay most of them and so we don't really talk about them until we get to nuclear chemistry and chem 2 and then of course there are lots of um, whole courses that you can use to study those so first things first so that's why they kind of took them out plus that periodic table wouldn't fit on a page very well if we put those in there so we took them out so that we can just focus on these and see how they re relate to each other so the main group elements 1a 2a 3a 4a 5a 6a 7a 8a are main group elements and they are going to follow rules the transition elements which are your b's in the blue are going to some of them will follow the rules some of them don't some of them follow some of the rules so they just don't and it's not just to make it hard for you it's because whenever we do these things it's because that's how they occur in nature and we try to make make them do what we say and find the patterns and things like that but you know nature has a has a will of its own if you watch jurassic park okay all right so electron one thing that that we do uh, that goes along with the study from we from what we did in in chapter two is electron configuration and um, you may have done this in high school that's fine it's it's kind of similar um, but this is how we fill the orbitals with electrons in an atom electron configuration and that quantum mechanical theory tells us how they behave and it shows us that they're in orbitals and it describes which orbital they're in and so when we actually account for the electrons then that's called electron configuration we're actually accounting for how many electrons are in each one of those orbitals and the example I have for you here is hydrogen which is our lightest element it only has one electron so it is going to go into the lowest n and the lowest l and it has one electron in there and so we call that one s1 for its orbital and that's the address of that electron 1s1 now no two electrons can have the same address or they can or the other the chemistry way of saying that is the same set of four quantum numbers so no orbital can have more than two electrons and the electrons must have the opposite spin that's the poly exclusion principle and if you remember i told you about this because that's where that last quantum number comes from which is the m sub s and so the way we show that is in the case of helium which has two electrons we can hold up to two in the 1s orbital so the helium has a 1s2 remember hydrogen had a 1s1 because it only had one electron helium has two electrons so we fill that up okay now if i draw it in a orbital diagram okay I'm gonna show you one arrow up and one arrow down and sometimes you'll see just a, a blank I do it because I'm too lazy to draw boxes um, sometimes you'll see a full arrow like that but usually you're gonna see this whatever you do to show me one up and one down right for hydrogen it would have just been one up right so as we fill it we're going to fill each one of those orbitals in order of increasing energy with their electrons because that's how the electrons are going to fill so for helium helium is n equals one it has l equals zero and it has m sub l of zero okay so that's 
the energy level 1. That's an s orbital because it's l equals 0. Then m sub l, it's a 0 because that's all it can be. Notice that this is electron number 1 and this is electron number 2 and they have the exact same three numbers until you get to that last one and then the only difference between those two electrons is one spinning one way and one is spinning the other way. So that's why we have that. And you have to have um, two electrons with different quantum numbers. Okay, and so that M sub S is what makes them different. So when we are splitting them up, we must fill up each energy level before we move on. Okay, now the sublevels we have S, P, D, and F in the principal energy shell. Um, they all have the same energy. Okay, so if I have two in the S, they're at the same energy level or ground state. If you have lots of electrons, the energies of the sublevels are split. So in the case of p orbitals where I have like three different ones, I have like p sub x, p sub y, and p sub z, all right, I'm going to have them, if it's full, I could have up to six electrons, right? And so they're going to split up, but they're still going to be degenerate. The lower the value of L, the less energy it's going to have. So S orbitals have less energy than P orbitals, have less energy than D orbitals, have less energy than F orbitals. Okay, so as we go up, we're going to go up in energy. So it goes S, P, D, F. The energy goes that way. So off ball, nice name, came up with another rule about this. And he says that atomic orbitals are going to feel from the lowest energy to the highest energy. That's called the off ball principle. Now, Coulomb, if you've ever had physics, Coulomb's law is, is a physics thing. It has to do with the attraction and repulsion of charged particles, kind of like a magnet. If you've ever done a magnet and you've got a plus and a minus pole on a magnet, if you've got the opposite ends, they will go together and be attracted. But if they're both the positive ends, they will push each other away. And so electrons are more strongly attracted to a nucleus that has a positive, more positive charge than a less positive charge. So if it had a plus two charge, it would the electrons would be attracted to that more than if it had a plus one charge. So when you have a lot of electrons in an atom, each one of those electrons is going to have an attraction to the positive protons in the nucleus. Okay, they're all going to be attracted to it, but because that's a negative charge, right? So they're got like, Ooh, I like you because you're opposite, right? But they're going to be repulsed from each other. So it doesn't like to get near the electrons. And so you're going to be attracted to the nucleus, but you're going to be repulsed by the other electrons. So that sets the stage for something called shielding. So the, the total amount of attraction that the electron feels for the positive nucleus is called effective nuclear charge. So the more protons you have, basically, the more attraction you have for the electrons. The repulsions are going to be caused by the electrons that are around that positive nucleus, okay, and that causes a decrease in the attraction. And this is what we call shielding. The electrons shielded from the nucleus and the more electrons there are between your electron you're looking at and the nucleus, the more shielding it has. Penetration 
causes the energies of the sublevel to not be degenerate. That is, if you if that electron can penetrate through some of those other electrons, then it's going to be at a lower level, right, than it would be if it was out farther away. Okay, so that's our introduction to chapter 3 and electron configuration.